So we, we have next, we have Joris van um, Heiningen. <laughs> Sorry, I know I have a Dutch last name, but I can't speak Dutch. Um, and he's going to talk to us about LGWA Soundcheck, a mission to explore the seismic environment of a permanently shadowed lunar crater. We are uh, going to talk about a Pathfinder mission for the Lunar Gravitational Wave Antenna called LGWA Soundcheck, uh, which is a mission to explore the seismic environment of a uh, permanently shadowed uh, region, namely a crater on the South Pole. Uh, before that, I'd like to uh, stress that I don't speak uh, on behalf of only me or my institution, uh, UC Leuven, where I'm a uh, research scientist, but all these institutions uh, work together towards the mutual goal of putting a gravitational wave detector on the moon. So obviously gravitational waves are a new thing, uh, originated first um, uh, by these two black holes. This was the first signal that we detected. Uh, they traveled for 1.3 billion years to arrive on Earth and stretch and squeeze space-time, uh, thus also the Earth, where the scale of this effect is vastly exaggerated. Because in reality, we need these uh, large kilometer-scale interferometers, like this one in uh, LIGO, uh, where a Michelson interferometer does the measurement for you, and the stretching and squeezing of space-time is converted into these flashes of light uh, that you saw there. Now, the over four kilometers, the uh, apparent movement of these mirrors is a factor billion uh, uh, smaller than the movement on Earth. So you have to decouple this detector uh, by suspending and those kinds of things uh, from the Earth's motion. Now, for the Moon, this uh, uh, works a bit differently. You saw the Earth wobbling, but of course, uh, the Moon does uh, something similar. Here, vastly exaggerated, uh, as, as for oil mode. And uh, the moon is a much quieter place, so we can go about and, 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 and put an inertial sensor on the moon itself. So it's a very different concept where we don't decouple from uh, the uh, usual motion of that planet or moon that we're on, but we uh, put an inertial sensor on it. So here I would like to show you two cases uh, to uh, discuss this, uh, this concept and, and show you how we get a signal. So uh, one fictive case is where we put our uh, sensor on a liquid planet. Of course, we can't do that, so we need a little boat, as you can see. But if a gravitational wave uh, stretches and squeezes this uh, liquid planet, then uh, this liquid planet will just uh, uh, follow along with the changing gravitational wave potential because it has no shear modulus. Um, the suspended uh, proof mass inside your inertial, uh, inertial sensor uh, also follows along with this uh, uh, with this changing gravitational potential. So, uh, in effect, because an inertial sensor measures the uh, differential displacement between the frame in which you suspend the proof mass and the proof mass itself, uh, you will not measure any signal. So, how does that work for a solid planet, or in this case, the Moon? Now, the stiffness of the Moon itself. Uh, uh, We'll, uh, yeah, we'll make sure that the moon doesn't uh, follow along with the changing gravitational wave potential, uh, but it uh, yeah, resists it a little bit. So it has some sort of elastic, uh, elastic uh, response to that. Uh, however, the proof mass does move along with that uh, changing gravitational potential. Therefore, um, you you won't get uh, uh, you won't get what you, what we saw in case one, and you will actually get a signal. So what's our plan then? Um, here you see the moon, but let's make it a little bit clearer. Uh, the stretching and the squeezing of the moon, we intend to put an array of these inertial sensors uh, on there. And we intend to do so on, um, on the South Pole in the permanently shadowed uh, regions. Uh, for example, the purple regions here, they're all natural cryostats below 40 Kelvin. And that will help us a lot because uh, inertial sensors are typically very uh, 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 yeah, susceptible to changes in temperature, and uh, a low temperature will also generate a low thermal noise, which is, for the frequency region that we're interested in, uh, uh, interesting. So this was uh, this concept was published uh, last year uh, in this paper uh, here, and uh, we, as you saw already from the from the. Um, 
uh, slide with all the logos. We're a growing international uh, community and we'd like to grow even more. So if you want to join, uh, please send me an email. So about our sensitivity, um, I would like to build up this graph uh, uh, together with you. So here you see uh, frequency on the horizontal axis uh, from a millihertz to about a hertz. Um, and you see a, a line drawn here, which is the sensitivity of my inertial sensor. And typically that uh, sensitivity uh, has the diagonal uh, determined by the uh, level of the thermal noise and the horizontal uh, right about here. Uh, determined by the uh, readout noise. Uh, this could be an interferometric readout or uh, a squid readout, as we will see later. But the, the inertial sensor is only one part of the uh, detector, because if we add the moon, uh, then we get a sensitivity to, to strain, so this stretching and squeezing um, caused by the gravitational waves. So the moon also has some resonant behavior, uh, 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 so where uh, frequencies at which the moon uh, likes to be excited and these will give us extra sensitivity so that's what you see here these notches uh, in this graph um, and we can compare this to other gravitational wave detectors that are planned uh, for the future uh, to be operational in the second half of the next decade so 2035 or so uh, which is lisa which is uh, three satellites uh, revolving around each other uh, they are uh, two and a half million kilometers apart and will experience the same stretching and squeezing which can be detected. And the Einstein telescope, which is the next generation of terrestrial uh, gravitational wave detectors uh, that will be built in, in Europe. And you can see they uh, leave open this gap uh, in what we call the decihertz band. So the band from 100 millihertz to about a hertz. Uh, and the lunar gravitational wave antenna can can fit right in and, and bridge this gap. So now we look a little bit more on how such an array would look like. So here we see uh, the crater in which we uh, want to deploy. Uh, this could be of arbitrarily large range as long as it makes this uh, large size, as long as this makes uh, uh, a place where we can put this uh, kilometer size array. So we see that we have uh, uh, four seismic stations, one in the middle uh, going to three. Um, and uh, in the beginning, in, in the middle, there's this central station, because now that we're in a, uh, if we want to have a long-term mission uh, and we are in a, um, in a permanent, permanently shattered region, then we need some sort of powering. Uh, one of the um, uh, solutions that is proposed is putting solar panels on the edge of the uh, crater and then uh, microwave beaming it down. But these are all technologies that uh, uh, need to be developed. So if we zoom in on one of these uh, seismic stations, uh, we can see what an example of what we, what we could find inside. So here you see, uh, like I said, some sort of uh, frame uh, in which a proof mass is suspended. And then uh, with, for example, a, a squid readout, and uh, maybe another uh, larger range uh, readout called uh, Rasnik that we shall see more about later. Um, that makes sure that uh, uh, we can get a clean signal out of this uh, out of this system. Uh, these actuators are superconducting coils, so they rely on uh, an even colder temperature than uh, 40 Kelvin. But 40 Kelvin is a nice starting point, uh, and that's why we need this uh, very low vibration absorption uh, cooler. Um, that I won't go into detail uh, in, other than that it's flown to Mars and is now being developed for a uh, gravitational wave uh, detector research facility in Maastricht. Um, but something that we want to get out of these Pathfinder mission is, of course, uh, getting acquainted with deploying these kinds of uh, seismic stations, mm -hmm. but also we'd like to get a better uh, seismic measurement of the lunar surface, because the best seismic measurements that we have is uh, uh, from the Apollo missions. Here you see uh, in the Desiertz band, uh, um, uh, you see here the, these dotted lines, and these are the lowest uh, spectra that you will ever measure on Earth. So you can already see from the measurement that, that has been done on, on the moon that it's a lot quieter there. However, this is the sensor noise of the sensors that were put there, so we don't actually know how low it is. Some, some models, uh, suggest that it's uh, uh, more in the region of uh, 10 minus 12, 
uh, 10 minus 13 meters per hertz. But we would like to know that. So here you can uh, see that uh, we are developing this uh, uh, Rasbat uh, sensor that will um, uh, yeah, be much better than the uh, commercial sensors that are available uh, and hopefully also better than the VBB, which is part of the far side seismic suite, which will be um, uh, deployed in uh, uh, two or three years. So this is with the technology um, that will reach five picometer per root hertz. And in the future, uh, we hope to reach uh, one picometer per root hertz. And this readout is the is the Rasnik that I uh, that I showed you before. So the Rasnik also measures the proof mass motion by projecting a backlit mask via some uh, objective onto a pixel sensor, and then the motion of this uh, 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 image of this mask uh, can be uh, can be extracted. Uh, here you see a picture of the of the prototype, and here a technical drawing. Uh, here you see a movie of the mask uh, slowly moving uh, because this is uh, tuned, can be tuned to uh, 200 milliards or something like that. Uh, and here we're just getting the, the first measurements out, which are, for example, uh, ring down measurements. We push the mask to one side and then just, uh, just let it go. So we would like to uh, test our, uh, both our LGWA seismic uh, sensors, but also our um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the Pathfinder mission. So we want to create a very quiet environment uh, by these two actively controlled platforms, uh, but then we need to apply cooling to that to get to 40 Kelvin. Um, and therefore we need this very uh, low vibration uh, uh, thermal uh, uh, link. Because as you know, uh, your refrigerator, so also your, your uh, 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 cryo cooler uh, will make some vibration. So we need some uh, here we have, for example, um, um, uh, yeah, gaseous uh, uh, transfer uh, that is uh, not in contact, and these flexi circuits and suspended uh, links uh, make it so that we expect the vibrations here to be lower, uh, such that we have a lunar made lunar conditions, low vibrations and cold, and can test our sensors uh, in there. So other things that we're trying to do, so we're putting these four sensors there. We want to be able to uh, subtract the seismic background uh, using the uh, subtraction techniques for other sorts of noise that were developed for uh, the terrestrial gravitational wave detectors like uh, Virgo. And we're doing two, that. Two uh, minutes. Yes, thank you two very minutes. much. Uh, and we're doing that on the on the slopes of Etna because there uh, the uh, soil uh, uh, is very, um, yeah, looks a lot in certain ways like the moon uh, uh, regolith. Uh, so we can not only subtract the uh, seismic background, but also uh, 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 yeah, subtract local events rather than global uh, events that are local events like uh, impacts of uh, meteors or something like that, uh, and uh, uh, rather than global events like uh, gravitational waves. So one thing about the science that we can do, one plot that I wanted to show you was uh, multiband observations. So again, you saw Lisa and, uh, and in this case, also the Cosmic Explorer. So that's the one that is going to be built in, in uh, America. And there you see uh, certain sig signals of uh, in spirals. So two objects getting closer to each other and uh, merge. So for example, you see the uh, binary neutron star uh, that in 2017 uh, showed us where gold was, for example. We can we can already uh, early warn much better, so we can uh, tell uh, conventional astronomers where to look. Uh, these where these lines start is five years before the in spiral, um, and here you can see all uh, some other traces, uh, some of which start in LISA uh, and via the lunar gravitational wave antenna go all the way through into the terrestrial band. Uh, one that is also interesting that uh, we might actually see the merger of is if there's a certain uh, mass uh, uh, ratio of uh, intermediate mass black holes. So then you should think of uh, uh, total mass systems of a thousand solar masses, uh, which you can see here in the in the top right of my uh, uh, of my summarizing slide. Um, here you see a smaller black hole uh, being gobbled up into a larger black hole. So I'll, uh, I can, uh, I'll leave this one up for you to uh, read. One thing that I would like to uh, stress is that uh, uh, with 
such sensitive um, inertial sensors, we can do much more than measure gravitational waves. We can look more at the interior of the moon, perform ge uh, lunar geophysics, but also uh, when our uh, goals are met, uh, we can start thinking about uh, lunar prospecting, looking at uh, helium-3 or rare earth metals that we can uh, find into the moon, even uh, with an active campaign where our, uh, usually on Earth you do that with uh, TNT and explosions, here you can uh, make use of the constant barrage of, uh, uh, of, of meteors. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, be open for questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this really interesting talk. And it's it's like completely different than some of the geological things that we've had before. So this is another advent advantage of, of this conference that we really get sort of a wide a variety of topics. Um, do we have any questions um, coming into the chat? I don't see anything. Um, we do need to move on, move on, but I, I wanted to ask you one really quick question is um, from the perspective of, of of your sensor network, uh, does it matter where it's placed on the moon or would there be a preference for near side, far side, north or south pole? Well, at the technologies that we're developing now, uh, we would really like to be in a, in a natural cryogenic uh, environment. So then uh, the craters on the poles would be your first choice. Um, but once those things are underway, if we want to get uh, um, yeah, get a handle on, for example, the polarization of gravitational waves, then we cannot stay in the in those craters. But we also need uh, seismic uh, stations, uh, uh, yeah, on other parts of the moon. Um, I don't know if there's then a preference, uh, but we would have to develop technology that that can uh, provide the same stability uh, um, for that. Okay, super. Thank you. Yeah, very very interesting.